and thank you to everyone for joining us today. Uh, I'm honored to introduce Marilyn Cloitra. She's the Asso Associate Director of Research at the National Center for PTSD Division of Dissemination and Training and Clinical Professor Affiliate of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Stanford University. Her work for the past 30 years has focused on the long-term effects of chronic trauma on social and emotional functioning. She is past president of the International Society for Traumatic Stress Studies and was a member of the World Health Organization ICD-11 Working Group on Trauma Spectrum Disorders. Marilyn, thanks so much for being here. Well, thank you, Jan, for inviting me. And um, I am so pleased that we have a, a trauma division now in American Psychological Association, and I am so glad for the leadership um, of individuals who push this forward. Um, so with that, um, I will begin my presentation today. I am basically going to talk about the um, development of ICD-11, PTSD and complex PTSD, as well as some of the treatment implications. And I'm going to try to talk only for about 45 minutes so we can have a wide-ranging discussion because I'm sure people have a lot of questions about ICD. Um, since um, many may not be particularly familiar with this diagnostic system and, or its implications for treatment. So let me see if I can move this forward. Okay. All right. So the World Health Organization is located in Zurich, Switzerland, and it is mandated to develop a diagnostic system that's used worldwide, and there is a commitment of all member nations of, of the United Nations to use the ICD-11, and that includes the United States. As many of you know, ICD is actually the uh, primary classification system used by most hospitals, services, and insurance companies. Um, the exception is psychiatry, which uses DSM. So for many years when I was a frontline clinician in a hospital setting, we used ICD. A diagnostic code so that we could be consistent with other departments, so cardiology, gynecology, etc. And so psychiatry um, also used ICD, but we were allowed to use DSM as well. Um, and I think probably that option is going to stay as we move forward into the new ICDs. Um, I think one of the important things that's happened is as a result of um, Obamacare, essentially, that there has been a request that ICD be the primary classification system for, di for, for diagnosis and reimbursement. So that is its implications for the US, but, but the broader mission of ICD and the World Health Organization is to have a shared language to track diseases, identify effective interventions, and um, deploy resources worldwide. You know, its mission is is really global, and WHO is part of the UN. Um, the ICD-11 um, procedures began in about, I think, 2012 or 2011. The technical work, which we completed, involved a review of the literature um, and our proposals for diagnoses. The World Health Organization has an advisory board, and it gave approval to um, the mental health disorders in 2015. So I think um, what I will be showing you um, has been supported by the advisory board. And so we expect these diagnoses, ICD-11, PTSD, and complex PTSD, um, to be released and available for use in 2018. Um, the procedures by which ICD-11 has been developed is really through an iterative process of input from stakeholders, and that includes um, member nations. It includes particularly third world, um, third world organizations. Um, it will be a free and open resource for the global community. I'm going to move my phone. Sorry about that. 
Um, the ICD-11 will be a free and open resource for the global community, say unlike DSM, which I think the APA has a fee for its book, and it will be available on the internet, on iPhone, etc., with the idea that we really do want global reach. Okay, this is just a little bit of background on who was in the work group. It was chaired by Andreas Marker from Switzerland. There was a you know, a variety of people from different countries. Um, the main organizers and are Jeffrey Reed from the U.S. And, and Mark Van Omeren from the Netherlands, and they continue to be the guiding force in um, the development documentation of the ICD-11 for mental health. All right, I just have to mention that the views expressed in this pre presentation are my own and do not represent WHO policy. So what was very interesting about working on um, the ICD diagnoses is that unlike DSM, <clears throat> we were strictly <clears throat> told that the, the guiding principle for the development of the disorder should be clinical utility. And what does clinical utility mean? It means that it should be useful to clinicians. Um, and we were, you know, given guidelines as to what this is. It first of all means that what we propose in our um, diagnostic categories should be consistent with clinicians' mental health taxonomies. taxonomies. The symptoms in the diagnosis should be pretty limited, no subtypes for simplicity's sake, and based on distinctions important for management and treatment. So it was very different from DSM, which has been, I think, driven predominantly by um, research and research needs. We were sort of worked backwards. It was very refreshing in a way to work from a grassroots perspective. What does the clinician on the ground need? And this is a very interesting paper by Jeffrey Reed um, with over a thousand, maybe up to five five thousand clinicians worldwide saying, you know, diagnoses are too complex. There are many countries in which um, people are out in the field. They don't carry around their um, diagnostic manuals. They need to be able to remember the diagnoses. Um, they might use their iPhones um, to help them in, in doing some diagnoses. But basically, they want key symptoms that they can easily see when they meet their patients and have the symptom profile translate fairly quickly into what's the management guidelines and what are the treatment guidelines for this patient. So it was a very different kind of um, um, task in front of us when we thought about how to develop the diagnoses. Um, very quickly and briefly, the ICD-11 PTSD is comprised of three clusters that are the classic clusters. And the conceptualization around it is really PTSD as a fear condition, where all the symptoms are directly linked to the traumatic event. So it's re-experiencing, avoidance, and sense of current threat. ICD complex PTSD is a little bit more complex. And it was derived from a diagnosis that is already in the books in ICD. Um, the instructions were we could not create new diagnoses. Um, we could only review current diagnoses and propose revisions. So actually, ICD did have a version of complex PTSD called Enduring Personality Changes as a Result of Catastrophic Events. It was in the Personalities Disorder section. Um, it kind of sat there all by itself. I don't think that many people used it, not for research, not for clinical purposes. But um, we were given this disorder from the personality section to put under the overall umbrella of disorders related to, to stress and traumatic stress. And this disorder had a few characteristics. First of all, its symptoms were organized into sort of three domains, affective, self, and interpersonal. And I think in general, most of the personality disorders um, think along the lines of these three domains, which is interesting and, and seems important, affective, self, and interpersonal problems. And unlike PTSD, the characteristics tend to be persistent across time and pervasive, you know, occur across different situations, 
regardless of um, whether a traumatic stimulus is present or not, you know, unlike PTSD, which is very bound up with reactivity to a stimulus, a traumatic stimulus. Um, Mary the concept, Lynn. yes? Mary Lynn, it's Dan. Sorry to interrupt. Um, we've gotten some feedback that um, some of our audience is not able to see all of your slides, the full screen, so I'm wondering if there's a way maybe to adjust that a little bit. They're just a little sure. bit on the bottom and the side, I think. Oh, um, I am not sure how to fix that. Um, I think I'm in full screen mode. I will. Okay. People can see your screen. I think that it might be maybe if you could um, shrink your video, your video feed on your screen. You, if you can make yourself a little bit smaller on your screen, that might give us the full slide. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see, I see, I see. That might be it. Um, I have moved myself into a very tiny box. Is that better? Yeah, I think, I, I think actually it is. All right, I'm going to wait until I get a little feedback. Is that better? Okay. It looks the same on my screen. Um, Can you? And I'm off. Um, you know, it might be because my computer. That, and my computer just looks, it just went a lot bigger. And I can see the full screen, so yes. Yes, and people are starting to say that it's looking better. Okay. No, okay, good. okay. Some people are having Thank issues. You, but I think that what maybe what if you as you continue to change it, the um, the screen, it might get a little bit better. Oh, okay. Okay. Sorry to interrupt, Marilyn. Thank you so much. Thank no you. problem whatsoever. So um, the conceptualization of complex PTSD was that, um, in contrast to PTSD, which is a sort of the core symptoms, of course, are a fear condition. And, and complex PTSD acknowledged, you know, the presence of fear conditioning, but alongside uh, with this conceptualization was the idea that um, under conditions of repeated or chronic exposure to traumatic stressors that there are changes in self-organization alongside and with the PTSD symptoms themselves. Um, there were data from the DSM-4 field trials that most people, 94% of individuals who endorsed sort of the complex symptoms around affective self and interpersonal domains also endorsed the core um, fear symptoms of um, re-experiencing avoidance and hypervigilance. So those data led to the um, conclusion, let me see if I can move myself forward. Oh, no. And let me get out of this. Can you all now just see, look like I'm trying to go into my OneNote? I cannot okay. see that. Okay. <laughs> okay, good. That's a good thing. All right. <laughs> all right. So um, I'm just going to skip this slide because we're losing a little time. So this is what um, the PTSD and complex PTSD classification looks not like now in ICD, that there's this general parent category called post-traumatic stress disorders. And there's a gate criterion that a person needs to have a traumatic stressor. And depending on their symptom profile, they'll either get the diagnosis of PTSD, the re-experience, avoidance, and hyperarousal symptoms, or they'll get complex PTSD, re-experiencing, avoidance, and hyperarousal, those three clusters, plus the additional three for the complex version, affective dysregulation, negative self-concepts, and interpersonal disturbances. What's interesting about this approach is that the type of trauma is a risk factor, not a requirement for having one or the other disorder. This takes into account genetic and environmental factors so that individuals with complex trauma histories can develop, quote, only PTSD if they've got good social support or high resilience, and we see that. And conversely, vulnerable individuals with a single assault, um, adult onset trauma, may develop CPTSD 
if they have certain vulnerabilities like you know substance abusing parents or a poor um, home environment, etc. So um, the, what I just um, described is the proposal, and there's been now some um, empirical investigations testing this idea, and we hope by 2018 to have pretty strong data uh, supporting the proposed diagnoses. And the questions we've asked are the routine questions. Can each disorder be measured? Do they describe different populations? Are they associated with different antecedents? And are they associated with different levels of impairment? And um, as a way to begin these investigations, many people around the world, particularly in Europe, have begun doing data analyses to ask these questions using archival data, what's available. You know, it doesn't really make too much sense to develop a new measure um, if there's no you know, ba basic data from um, work that's already been done. So um, this is an example of a study that I've done, and many other people have now done this type of work, which is to identify items from other data sets that reflect the concept uh, or construct of PTSD. And so what you'll see here is um, two symptoms per, per cluster, nightmares and flashbacks, avoidance of thoughts, avoidance of people, and then hypervigilance and startle. And similarly, beginning with the idea that of trying to capture emotion regulations in a, in a very streamlined fashion here, uncontrollable outbursts of anger and feeling easily hurt, negative self-concept, feelings of worthlessness, feelings of guilt, um, interpersonal problems, never feeling close to each other, feelings of detachment. And so the first question of whether the symptoms can be measured um, the answer is yes. What you'll see here is PTSD and what we're calling disturbances in self-organization as the complex part of complex PTSD are fairly related at 0.66. Um, but you know anything under 0.80 is fairly distinct. And what you'll see below is that the um, clusters really do hang together under PTSD, the fear sort of conditioning symptoms hang together, while the disturbances in self-organization under emotion regulation, negative self-concept, and interpersonal problems also hang very strongly together under the concept of disturbances in self-organization. Um, the question we asked is, do these two disorders describe different populations? And what you'll see here is the result of a latent class analysis where um, the red line identifies individuals with a certain uh, symptom profile. And this symptom profile looks awfully lot like PTSD, right? Pretty high on the PTSD symptoms and very low um, on the complex symptoms in comparison to the people who are described by the blue line, which are individuals who have the PTSD symptoms plus the disturbances in self-organization, sort of defining a group of people who have complex PTSD. And then the green line are individuals who are fairly low in both sets of symptoms. And I should mention that these data come from a clinic I was running in New York City. Um, uh, these are data for, oops, um, a period of time that actually followed 9-11. And so we had had a clinic that was really focused on interpersonal violence, and many of our clients at that time had chronic trauma. But with the influx of people from 9-11, we really had a mix of people who had adult onset trauma related to 9-11, as well as people who had been coming to us with chronic kinds of um, traumatic exposures. Um, so it was very interesting to look at the characteristics of these three groups of people. And what you'll see is that, um, that people who identified childhood abuse as their worst trauma were twice as likely to fall into the complex PTSD as the PTSD group. And conversely, and even more strongly, that people who identified 9-11 as their worst trauma were much more likely, four times more likely, to fall into the PTSD group as compared to the complex PTSD group. So what these data show are that, yeah, mm -hmm, 
These two disorders um, are characterized by people with different antecedents moving into their trauma history. And lastly, what you'll see here is um, that the people with complex PTSD uh, were substantially more impaired than those with PTSD as well as low symptoms. And importantly, those with PTSD were um, much more impaired than those with low symptoms. And it is a requirement for both of these disorders that individuals show impairment related to their symptoms. So the summary on our data so far indicate that um, PTSD and complex PTSD are distinguishable in being associated with distinct groups, distinct antecedents, and distinct levels of functional impairment. And to date, there have been five of six studies published um, supporting all of these distinctions, um, with one exception. So that looks pretty good. Um, in terms of whether or not the, the, these two disorders and these distinct disorders make sense to clinicians, there was a vignette study done um, engaging 1,738 mental health providers from 76 nations where the question was asked, can clinicians in fact differentiate complex PTSD from PTSD? And is the accuracy of the diagnosis improved from ICD-10? So what you'll see in this slide is um, the blue bars represent the, the PTSD vignettes and um, along the horizontal line, um, the right answer was this is a PTSD diagnosis. And so what you'll see is clinicians very much, over 90% of clinicians accurately diagnosed the PTSD vignette as PTSD with very few of them incorrectly diagnosing it as complex PTSD. What you'll see in the next pair of bars is the converse, where um, the red bar is the complex PTSD story, and in fact, um, very high, over 80% of the clinicians diagnosed it accurately as complex PTSD. And I think importantly, um, for complex PTSD in ICD-11, it's doing a much better job, significantly better job than ICD-10 um, enduring personality change, which is the very last pair of bars, where people didn't do too badly, about 62% identified what was called, you know, EPCAT uh, complex PTSD. But the arrangement of symptoms that we've proposed now seems to really facilitate differential diagnosis of um, complex PTSD compared to PTSD and presenting it as a yes, true yeses, as compared to um, other diagnoses and no diagnoses. So just very briefly, um, with these data, you know, clinicians seem to be able to distinguish between PTSD and complex PTSD. Archival data indicate, yep, people look pretty different. There are different classes of individuals. We've now um, started to develop um, me a measure which reflects the symptoms um, presented in the ICD-11. I'm not going to talk a lot about that because I believe we're going to run out of time, but just for everyone to know that this is the next step. We do need to have precise measures of both PTSD and complex PTSD. Um, this, these are sort of samples of disturbances in self-organization. We have a set of symptoms that are about general emotion dysregulation, I react to things intensely. It takes me a long time to calm down. My feelings tend to be easily hurt. Anger, reckless behavior, emotionally shut down. We have a couple of dissociation items. Sense of self is negative. I feel like a failure. I feel worthless. I feel ashamed. I feel guilty. And then three items about relationship with others, feeling distant, hard to stay emotionally close, and avoiding relationships because they're too difficult or painful. Um, we have now our first test of this measure of 230 consecutive admissions to a sort of chronic trauma clinic. And what you'll see again is confirming, yep, they have two groups of patients, those with PTSD um, and those with complex PTSD. The factor analysis looks really great, so that is good. One important question is whether complex PTSD is different from borderline personality disorder. And this slide is a bit of a whopper to look at, so I will just turn your attention to the key findings here, which is 
the solid gray line represents individuals who have complex PTSD in comparison to the solid uh, black line, which represents people who have borderline personality disorder. Um, these data come from my same clinic of, um, I think, about 230 women, all women, all of whom had come to the clinic because they had childhood sexual abuse. So that is their trauma, and the, I guess, take-home message here is, yeah, lots of them had borderline personality disorder, but there's a subset that just have this one thing called complex PTSD, and they can be discriminated. And lots of people say, well, you know, what is the difference between complex PTSD and BPD? And so um, I'm not going to show the data, but we looked at, you know, odds ratios of the characteristics of people who had borderline personality disorder versus complex PTSD. And this is the distinct profiles that you typically see, that individuals with BPD and CPS, CPTS, complex PTSD, both endorse emotion dysregulation. That's really not a characteristic or set of symptoms that distinguish the two disorders. But there are three key domains of problems where they look very different. And if you've worked clinically, I, I think you do see this, where individuals with borderline personality disorder um, strongly have fears of abandonment and unstable relationships. You know, that's sort of like they're inter in the interpersonal domain. They look very different. Where people with complex PTSD, by definition, in ICD, are very disconnected. You know, they're consistently avoidant in their interpersonal domains. They find relationships painful. Um, in terms of sense of self, borderline personality disorder, very unstable sense of self, lots of ups and downs, like relationships. They have relationships. They tend to be unstable, lots of ups and downs. People with complex PTSD um, tend to have very few relationships, and their view of themselves is stable. It tends to be very consistently negative. And it's related to the idea of chronic and sustained um, exposures to trauma where, you know, there's very low sense of mastery, deep sense of shame or guilt for not being able to manage their situations well. And there's also a difference in impulsive behaviors where, you know, when you think about um, suicidality, about 50% of individuals with BPD have made a suicide attempt, where in the complex PTSD domain, about, you know, 15%. So it's very significantly different, where I think in BPD, suicidality and self-injurious behaviors is your main symptom problem. It is the go-to problem that you want to address before you do other things. In complex PTSD, it may be there. And when it's there, of course, it's significant, but it's not um, a high-profile symptoms. And lastly, of course, in BPD alone, um, there's no need for or no requirement for an individual to have a trauma. So they may not have nightmares and flashbacks, where in complex PTSD, it's a plus. It's um, a requirement um, that they have some types of PTSD-ish symptoms and a trauma history, of course, where in BPD that's not a requirement for the disorder. So, you know, let's think about the um, implications for thinking about symptom profiles. And I'm going to throw out there the idea that there's this continuum of difficulties that we're trying to capture when we use different diagnoses, and they may range from PTSD through complex PTSD borderline personality disorder, and people who have both BPD and PTSD. And as clinicians, perhaps our goal is to neither over-treat nor under-treat our patients, but really to match our interventions um, to their symptom profile and to their needs. So one might think, I'm just throwing this out there, along the lines of matching our treatments to the complexity of the presentation. So individuals who have PTSD, say ICD-11 PTSD, um, a trauma-focused treatment would be a really good match for them. Complex PTSD, you have a combination of this fear conditioning thing going on, as well as really diminished capacities around emotion regulation and managing relationships. 
So you might want to do a treatment that has not only the trauma-focused work, but also some skills-based work. And I just mentioned STARE, which is a treatment that I've been involved in developing for some while. Borderline personality disorder, a good match is DBT. And people who have BPD plus PTSD, a combination, say, of DBT, which is about a year long, and um, integrating into it after some time the um, PE work. I think there are a couple of papers showing that that's, that work is going very nicely. My own thoughts um, that I'll throw out there is um, you know, that our patients tend to be very complex and we're moving forward to the idea of being more patient-centered. And I think one thing that means is collaborating with our patients and secondly, uh, working with them to be problem-focused possibly not necessarily diagnostically focused. And this idea came to me having lived in a child psychiatry department for at least 10 years where children, like people with trauma, have, present with a heterogeneity of symptoms. While kids are often diagnosed with X, Y, or Z, it was very obvious to me over watching a you know, child psychiatrist um, over a decade that they really match their interventions to the, to the dominant presenting problem of the child. So if they're bedwetting, um, have social problems, um, and are not going to school, they identify which is the key functionally impairing symptom. They identify that in collaboration with the parents and kids, and then they begin selecting modules or particular interventions that directly address this problem. And when the symptom seems to have subsided significantly in terms of impairment, it's causing the child and family, they go on to other kinds of um, focus, you know, focusing on other problems. And I think we can possibly do the same with our complex trauma patients and our maybe complex PTSD patients. Um, where we've thought a lot about sequencing our interventions, and I, I do think it's a good idea that an alternative that might be more satisfactory to our patients might be um, to develop uh, matrices. Um, and this, again, is it's actually some research that I'm beginning to do now, uh, but it presents a matching matrix of symptoms of complex PTSD um, to um, interventions that are evidence-based and we know work for this particular symptom set. So, for example, nightmares, we could do cognitive reappraisal plus doing a trauma narrative for hypervigilance, mm, emotion serving for anger, focused breathing, cognitive reappraisal, um, for dissociation, focused breathing, emotion surfing, for relationship problems, hard to maintain relationships, engaging in more pleasurable activities, engaging in strategies that increase social support. So um, I won't go through it systematically, and in fact this is just a, a subset of um, the matrix that we're developing, but it might be a way to recognize the heterogeneity of symptoms that present, that not all patients have every single symptom. Um, it may be also a way of increasing engagement into treatment and maintaining engagement in treatment over time and really having the patient um, have a voice and maybe even drive the organization of the treatment. So I'm going to stop there um, because I think my time may be up and my slides are done and um, take questions. Yeah. Oh, we're very good on time. Sure. Good. Yep, we're doing great. And thank you so much for a very wonderful and informative presentation, Marilyn. Um, one of our questions is about um, if you're aware of any studies that use the ICD in forensic situations over the DSM for diagnosing and talking about PTSD and complex PTSD. I don't know of any studies that have done that. Um, it's certainly the case that ICD. 10 is out now and can be used. Um, I think the problem with the ICD system is that there have not been evidence-based assessment measures, right? That's the problem. Um, and um, certainly now in Europe there are a network of clinical sites that are engaged in testing not only self-report measure that I identified but also 
a um, clinical interview. You know, so they're going through sort of item selection, and then there'll be test, retest, reliability, um, and then, yeah, construct validity, et cetera. So all that work is going on right now, I think, which will advance um, the use of these diagnoses for situations like uh, forensic settings and regular treatment uh, decision making. Okay, thank you. Here's the next question. Do you feel that behavioral activation could play a role in addressing the consistently low self-image within complex PTSD, or would something like STARE be more necessary to address the emotion regulation difficulties? Well, I think behavioral activation is a really wonderful intervention, and I think it can do a lot to um, address the numbing symptoms sort of getting people going, um, and similarly, as this person's mentioning, sort of that low self-esteem, low self-concept, I'm not capable of doing anything, I'm not engaged in the world. Um, I will say that STARE actually uses um, some aspects of behavioral activation around um, the requirement to engage and behave in pleasurable activities. Um, and we kind of use the analogy of, you know, you've been disengaged for a long time in life, you've been feeling numb for quite a while, you're like a car out in the middle of a Canadian winter, um, and you turn that ignition and you will engage in these behaviors and you will not feel any anything, but if you try over time, right, to engage in these behaviors, to take a walk, to have a little bit of a chocolate bar, um, to, you know, um, soothe your, to engage in sensory pleasures, you know, good sense, um, going to the beach, sunshine, whatever, um, mm -hmm. you'll turn that ignition over. So I think there's a way in which it's um, stare is similar to behavioral activation on the principle of getting people going, engaging in behaviors, and the cognition and the emotions will follow. Great. Thank you. Marilyn, will you address the issue of researchers who are attempting to uh, disqualify CPTSD as a freestanding diagnosis? Will I address that? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think there are people who have a lot of political motivation to dismiss the disorder. Um, to me, it doesn't make a lot of sense scientifically to keep saying something doesn't exist. I think what we need to do is take a scientific attitude The question where the question should be, does this thing exist or not, and evaluate it in terms of its positive results, you know, its presence. And I think that now we have five out of six studies from different populations, different samples, and different countries showing that people group out uh, very distinctly in the PTSD mm -hmm. versus complex PTSD clusters. And so I think it reflects a clinical reality. And by doing this, I think we get closer to the idea of patient-centered care as well as more efficient clinical care. Not everyone needs the same thing. You know, some people will need a short-term treatment, and when you save clinician time on people who need only a short-term treatment, then you have more clinical resources to give to people who are more complicated. And I will just say that as a clinician who worked with individuals who had been exposed to 9-11, um, it really opened my eyes to um, the speed at which some individuals can recover from, you know, the key PTSD symptoms pretty much by telling their story. You know, I had patients who came in after 9-11, and because I wasn't really sure what to do, you know, it was a terrorist attack, it was a sort of mass community violence event, um, there were no particular guidelines for how to intervene, you know, particularly in the early stages. So I said, what do you want to do? And many of them said, I want to understand what happened to me. I want to tell you what happened to me, and I said, okay. And um, sometimes in about three sessions um, of basically narrative work, their symptoms really plummeted 
and they felt pretty resolved. You know, a lot of people don't want to be in treatment. They don't want to be in treatment long. So it was very interesting and a learning experience for me to see really quite a range of the ways in which people can recover because I'd been so used to seeing people with very chronic histories who took a long time and still, you know, I believe do take a long time to get to a place where they feel fully functional. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, one of our audience members wanted to know uh, where to find more information on STAIR in the treatment of complex PTSD. Um, there is um, a really good book, uh, that um, workbook that came out in 2006 um, by myself, Cloytra, uh, Karsten Conan, and Lisa Cohen that Guilford Press um, published, came out in 2006, and that has a lot of, the has the STAIR interventions, has theory, it has session by session instruction, it has um, the, the worksheets um, to do both STAIR plus the narrative work. There is, um, at the National Center for PTSD, where I now work, a webinar which describes, which provides video demonstrations of how to do the STAIR component along with downloadables. So those are two really good sources. Um, and there's a book that just came out um, that was edited by Uli Schneider and myself in 2015 by Springer, which has a lot about STAIR, but also many other, um, a range of other interventions, uh, including NET, PE, CPT, um, and trying sort of to match them to appropriate patient populations. And, and that book is really cool and, and it was fun to put together. And I would okay. recommend it for people who want to get sort of a tasting menu of the different treatments. Mm -hmm. Mary Lynn, can you talk about um, any quote unquote problems with the fact that the DSM only has PTSD and the ICD has both PTSD and complex PTSD? And if so, how can frontline psychotherapists help in addressing those problems? Um, well, I think that people, I think the DSM-5 PTSD was intended to address some of the more complex trauma symptoms. Um, I think the problem with the uh, DSM-5 PTSD is that it has so many symptoms and, you know, it, it's, it's, it's very difficult, I think, to use those symptoms um, and carefully identify a, a symptom profile and then move to an effective treatment. You know, people have said that there are 500,000 ways of having DSM-5 PTSD. Um, its intention was to be sort of a big tent kind of summary of the various symptoms that people could have, regardless of the kind of trauma. Um, but I think it's the it's just going to be, I think, hard to use for clinicians. And I think ICD-11 is going more towards this idea of matching very refined profiles to treatment um, interventions and how a frontline clinician can help I think is by um, doing evidence-based work um, say for example using the PCL5 which is the DSM-5 um, assessment tool and then hopefully when it's ready in a year or two using the ICD-11 measure it will be short it will be brief it will be to the point and um, using it both before and after treatment and seeing you know, where clients make their change and see if the more streamlined version, ICD-11, actually is more precise and gets patients further and is more related to their functional impairment. So I would recommend using those two assessment measures um, plus maybe a, a functional status measure and, and seeing how it works. Okay. I hope that's well, a helpful getting... answer. I hope it definitely helpful. sounds like it. Uh, okay. Yes. Not sure and, if I uh, we're getting a. Mm -hmm. I think you did. Um, we're getting a lot of great questions from our audience here, so we're going to keep going. Um, okay. Is there any work being done to address um, vicarious or secondary trauma as a separate disorder? 
uh, an ICD? Um, no. It, w it wasn't specific. Oh, uh, you mean for clinicians? That's what I would assume, um, but it wasn't listed in the question, so maybe you can speak generally about it. Okay, I think it's a very important issue. Um, I think there's a lot of burnout with of trauma therapists. I think, especially when we think through the lens of World Health Organization, that the intention is ultimately to engage um, lay people in doing some of the very basic work because resources are so limited um, in various places that we also, I think, have to hand in hand think about ways of protecting uh, trauma therapists in doing the work that they do. And um, I think we have some basic ideas about self-care and perhaps when we get um, these assessment tools and so treatment matching strategies on our iPhones um, or, or, or web programs, we should also have a section on self-care. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Uh, Marilyn, are you aware of any assessment instruments to assist in evaluating PTSD versus CPTSD? Well, we do have, um, if you all can see this, we, ha we have this developing measure. We're, we're, we're ideally going to get it down to about 15 items so that can be used quickly in the field. And um, we will be developing an algorithm to distinguish PTSD from CPTSD. That is our goal, and um, we're working on it very actively right now. And hopefully by 2018, we'll be able to report some good results. Um, we're trying to test this instrument across different languages and cultures. So we can, and because that is the goal of WHO, it's to help people worldwide, which is really a challenge and maybe kind of hubristic not sure, but can we identify key symptoms that are present across languages, across cultures, and that distinguish PTSD from complex PTSD and help guide treatment? Mm -hmm. Okay. Here's the next question, Marilyn. How do you recommend treating the dissociative component of CPTSD, and do you think the new dissociative subtype of PTSD is, in fact, complex PTSD? Well, I'll answer the latter part first. We just finished um, a study um, looking at highly traumatized people and diagnosing them both in DSM-5 and ICD-11. And many had complex uh, PTSD, ICD-11 complex PTSD, and all of those with complex PTSD also had the dissociative subtype. So I think that the complex PTSD subsumes and includes the dissociative subtype. It didn't work the other way around as well. Mm. Um, in, in, in terms, so it's a broad, it, it seems to hit more on the other characteristics of dissociation. While the dissociative subtype, it didn't seem to really carry forward and recognize maybe some of the other emotion regulation problems. Um, in terms of treatment, I am not an expert in the dissociative disorders or dissociative symptomatology particularly. Um, and um, I, I, I don't feel really qualified to, to speak on that. I think, you know, um, experts in dissociative disorders say it's important really to um, engage, you know, organize, um, focus on the emotion regulation if that is the reason why a person is dissociating. Um, I think dissociative identity disorders is, is somewhat different. I know that ISSTD is recommending phase-based treatments for people with um, dissociative identity disorders. Okay. Thank you. Is there any intention to work on a separate diagnostic category for developmental trauma? Uh, in ICD-11, there is now initial steps in trying to develop um, measures that assess PTSD, ICD-11 PTSD in children, as well as ICD-11 complex PTSD in children. I'm very mindful and respectful of the fact that children are not little adults. 
and um, we're really trying to engage people who are developmentalists and work with children to think about these three key domains of um, negative self-concept, problems with relationships, and um, uh, hyper and the you know the emotion regulation, negative self-concept, and problems with um, people um, organizing around problems that kids manifest themselves. Um, I know that in IC in DSM five there is a, a subtype for children. Okay. Thank you. The, um, here's the next question. Um, the somatic focus of the complex PTSD framework doesn't seem to cover much else than hyperarousal, and has there been a consideration of interoceptive disruption? I am not sure what that means, interoceptive disruption. Um, there was a lot of discussion about the somatic symptoms. Um, I assume maybe yeah. like an interoceptive exposure intervention. Yeah, you know, that's interesting. I think that would go more towards the PTSD cluster, but maybe mm -hmm. that's just me. Yeah, I'd, I'd view that more as a PTSD, yeah, and an exposure-based intervention. Yeah, that goes to the PTSD side more. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. All right, um, let's see. We have a, um, a few more questions, so are you willing to go a few minutes over time, Marilyn? Sure. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, let's see, symptom structure is only one of many quote-unquote diagnostic validity criteria. Um, others include family history, age of onset, treatment response, etc. cetera, uh, the Robbins and Goose approach. Um, are you familiar with this program of diagnostic validity? I have seen the Robin and Goose um, articles. I haven't read them yet. I think it's a great idea. Um, and for ICD-11, I think we should try and satisfy all those crit criteria of validity. And we'll try. Um, you know, in a way, yeah, in a way, we've, we've, we've looked at the antecedents. Um, and I think, importantly, we'll ultimately look at treatment matching and out treatment outcome is going to be the most important um, validity criterion for ha having this differential diagnosis. Okay. Um, maybe we can uh, figure out this question a little bit together. Uh, I'm assuming this person is asking if you're familiar as a follow-up to the last question with the Courtois and Ford um, um, very recent treatment of complex PTSD. Um, I am. I'm not sure. I'm familiar with the most recent. I know Chris Courtois and, and um, Julian Ford, and um, I think we're we're all pretty much on the same page about uh, useful ways to engage in treatment. Um, I think maybe there's a movement from looking purely at phase-based work to thinking about treatment in phases. That's not so radical, you know. Um, mm -hmm. But, but <laughs> it's like, why I become so radical? I don't know. But um, if we think about treatment phases um, where we engage the patient as well, like what do you want to accomplish first? And if we're successful with that, what would you like to do second? And then what would you like to do third? I think we're probably weakest as a profession on that third phase, which is once your patient is feeling fairly well, how do they transition into a community, into a life without treatment, you know, where they shift their identity from a trauma survivor to a, maybe a, a person who's living in the world with a history of trauma? I think that's an interesting area, that phase, phase three, that, that we really haven't done much work on anywhere or, or talk about very much. Mm -hmm. Okay. One of our um, audience members wants to know if you recommend the use of EMDR. Yeah, I do. I can't say I understand why it works, and I know there are lots of um, basic science explanations proposed for it, um, but I think like many medications, we don't know exactly why it works, but it seems 
to work, and so we use it, and we can work backwards from the observation of okay, how do people get better with EMDR, what, and to why do they get better? I think it's a very interesting treatment option, you know, because it doesn't require people to speak aloud about their trauma, which I think is very interesting, but to think about it and visualize it in um, detail, and it might work for um, different people, you know. Um, I think different kinds of trauma-focused work, again, might um, be better, might be good or less good for different kinds of people, and we haven't figured out that piece either. Um, so, you know, some people do better imaging, some people do better using words, some people do better creating representations of their trauma via art. I don't think we should discount any of these different modalities as means of um, organizing and processing the traumatic experience. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think this might be our last question here, Marilyn. Uh, and it's a, it's a question regarding nomenclature. Um, why complex PTSD as opposed to complex trauma? Well, this is a very good question. Um, and I think it is important that we distinguish the events, which is the trauma, from its consequence, which um, are the symptoms. So complex PTSD refers to the symptom profile. Complex trauma refers to the experience. Of, of often multiple chronic and uh, repeated experiences. Okay, great. Well, um, Marilyn Cloister, thank you so much for, again, um, sharing your research and your insight into your work on the ICD-11 with us. Um, it's been a great honor to have you here. Yeah, well, it's been my pleasure, um, and I appreciate having been asked. Absolutely. Um, before we sign off for today, I did want to let our audience know that um, we are going to take a month off for um, our Division 56 webinars for the APA convention. But in September, we will be back. Um, on September 30th, Alicia F. Lieberman will be presenting on Speaking the Unspeakable, the Identification and Treatment of Childhood Trauma. So I hope you can join us then. Marilyn, again, thank you so much, and have a good, great weekend, everybody. Yeah. Same here. Bye now. Thank you.